So, beating the shark, capturing packets for analysis, that's what we're talking about today. So if you're expecting something with coding, it's not it. We just summarized my bio, so I won't spend a ton of time on this. Um, I'm a founding member with some of the other great guys in this room of uh, DC801, 801 Labs, local hackerspace. So if you guys haven't checked out the hackerspace in Salt Lake, please do come out, say hi. And uh, occasionally I will mentor SANS courses as they came up, uh, specifically 542 and 560, which is web app pen testing and network pen testing. So, uh, oh, one more thing is Hacker Camp. It's an annual event we do every year where we all get together out in the middle of nowhere and take on a bunch of high-tech, low-tech hacking challenges sort of off-grid. So there'll be some announcements coming out. We're hoping to do that again this year in June. So here's what we're going to talk about today. Um, we're going to talk about how to get packets and where to get packets. Uh, we're going to use a packet capture analysis tool to dive into a couple different scenarios and figure out what's going on with our network. It's, it's some real world examples that I've pulled out of my personal experience uh, where you want to dig into a network device or a server and figure out what's happening at the network layer. It's becoming more important, especially as we see more and more virtualization, compartmentalized IT groups where you don't always have access to rip the wire out of the socket and put a tap in line. So we're not going to spend a ton of time in Wireshark. I'm going to give you some Wireshark resources, but we're not focused on Wireshark specifically. Today we're talking about how to get the packets. Uh, this talk's going to be freely available. There's a link at the end of it. You can download the talk and there's a couple of resources with it. So don't worry about scribbling down notes if you see a link on here. The whole presentation will be available in uh, PowerPoint format, Keynote format, if anybody else uses that goofy program, uh, PDF uh, for those of us who don't want to deal with slides, and it's just one big zip file on the site. So. So a key point for today is we're talking about non-invasive packet capture techniques, which how we can get traffic without ripping the wire out of the wall, without doing a physical tap, without calling up our buddies at the NSA and asking for their copy of our traffic. So we want to dive into a production system, pull our traffic out, analyze it offline, and determine what's going on. So in this room, is anybody brand new to Wireshark, never used Wireshark, no idea, not real experience? Jason, okay. We'll talk afterwards. If you're new to Wireshark, here's some great resources. Um, like I couldn't exclude, Left Shark had to come out. That was just a given. <laughs> we needed Left Shark. If you don't know who Left Shark is, Google it up. It's pretty entertaining. Um, <laughs> there is that. So the Wireshark blog talks about all the latest things that are happening. Uh, Wireshark documentation is deep, but it's very good. Um, there is a whole system of classes that you can take attached to the Wireshark website. And I think the first three courses are free. So you can sign up and get some familiar with sifting through network traffic. I think it's Laura Chappelle has her own little university. She writes a lot of books. Uh, and there's SharkFest. If you really want to go full nerd on this stuff, you can go to SharkFest. But they publish all their slides, the presentations, their documents from previous years. They have that at the Computer History Museum in California every year. Um, so lots of great content if you want to dive deep with Wireshark. So why do we want packets? Uh, well, let's think about what packets are. A packet is the traffic. It's the actual traffic. It's, it's not a log. It's not an SNMP trap. It's not NetFlow. These are evidence of traffic. The packet is the traffic. So if we have the ability to dive in and actually get the traffic from our device, we can see what it looks like in transit and what it looks like as it arrives to its target. Moving on to why we care about where the packets come from. So, does anybody in here not know what the OSI model is? No shame, just Danny, I know, I know, we'll get you there. Same two guys, perfect. Weed patch, great. <laughs> Such a genuine engagement with the audience. Yes, well, I understand. That's, that's why we start with mimosas. Um, so the OSI model, right? The fundamental concept, network building blocks, helps us understand the layers that our traffic goes through as it leaves one machine, crosses the network, and is built up in another. The way networking works is your traffic has to change in transit, right? MAC addresses will change as you go through layer three boundaries. If you're going through NAT devices, addresses are going to change. Sometimes protocols might be modif uh, modified if you're going through IPSs or proxies. So 
Where we look at the traffic is going to change what the traffic actually looks like. That's why it's valuable to have the skill set to go into a variety of different places on your network and look at the traffic throughout the path. One other quick note is many of the devices we'll pull traffic from have resource constraints. Uh, so firewalls, load balancers, switches, these things have a primary job and it's not traffic capture. Their primary job is usually to push traffic through. So we want to be very specific and explicit about how we define filters and how we create our packet capture. We don't just want to grab everything. We don't want to be greedy. Uh, and there's a couple practical reasons for that. So one of the practical reasons is compliance. If you work in an environment or you have a customer that is a sensitive environment, if you're dealing with account numbers, PII, financial information, perhaps PCI card data, you don't want to have your analysis now be part of the compliance scope if it doesn't need to be. There's no reason to grab customer data if that's not what you're interested in. Unless you're Danny and you're just grabbing all the data for your big fat report. But that's a different talk. Uh, and then practically captures take up space. So, you know, uh, we're, we're grabbing everything as it's seen across the wire. There's not any compression in play here. They get big quick. And the bigger they are, the more of a pain in the butt it is to sift through them, the slower the filters work, the slower they load. So, some terminology that we'll encounter. Um, for the purposes of this talk, a TAP is a hardware device which will provide access to the data flowing across the network. Uh, TAP gets thrown around a lot as a method, but for the purposes of today, it's a hardware device. Uh, span, monitor, mirror. Does anybody know the difference between those? You do. That's impressive because, yeah, <laughs> vendor, exactly. There really isn't a difference, right? So these terms are interchangeable. I'm going to use them interchangeably. Forgive me. It's, it, different vendors call it the same thing, and they, they have different technologies. It is important to know when we're talking about switches and routers, a lot of the vendors, particularly Cisco, don't play nice with the other vendors. And so as we're grabbing packets, it is sort of specific to each vendor, the, the technique we're going to use. Um, so PCAP, the basic uh, definition of a PCAP, it, it's actually a library. Um, and it's a library that runs in the IP stack that allows us to reach in and, and grab traffic. It's an API. So it's also a file output, but we'll talk about that in a minute. And then a trace file. Um, Microsoft decided that they wanted their own lingo, and so they refer to their packet captures as traces. We'll talk about that, but they use the event tracing for Windows framework to grab traffic. Uh, the advantage of that is it doesn't require a PCAP driver, and we'll dive a little deeper into that in a minute. So next, file types. The file types you're most likely to encounter. Uh, .cap is the old Netmon format. Uh, PCAP is what we see by default on a lot of packet capture tools. All the times if there's a packet capture baked into a smaller operating system like uh, Pan OS or iOS, it's going to dump to PCAP format. Um, PCAP NG is a new Wireshark format, and that supports tighter time definitions in multiple sources. Um, and .etl is event trace log, and that's Microsoft going off and doing their own thing, which always works out for them, right? Windows Phone. Yeah, yeah, the Zoom's great, right? Does anybody have one? The museum somewhere? Okay, so uh, this might seem a little obvious, but one of the things, if you're getting started with traffic analysis, uh, one of the things we like to talk about is a, a, an adapter to use. There's some really practical constraints around what adapter you want to use. You certainly can use a wireless adapter, but oftentimes we want to play in the copper world. And if we're going to play in the copper world, Let's use gigabit adapters so we have the ability to get the appropriate amount of speed, and let's use a bus that can actually support a gigabit adapter. What's the problem with a gigabit adapter on a USB 2? Yeah, 480 megabits per second, right? So if it's a busy network, that's going to be a legitimate problem. So if you go to the Apple store and buy their little USB network adapter, you, you know, you paid 30 bucks and it's 100 megs that you're locked to with that thing. So these are just two examples. There's lots of great hardware out there. Um, Thunderbolt's nice if you have the Apple platform. It's a 10 gig backend, and the driver's pretty solid built into the OS. Um, it's also pretty cheap. I like to use a dedicated adapter for packet captures, and I'll talk about that a little bit more on the next slide. But we want to kind of segregate ourselves from the traffic that's on our box. We don't necessarily need Dropbox requests going out in the middle of our packet capture. Um, on the non-OSX side, or the non-Thunderbolt side, this StarTAC adapter is one of several great models. This particular one has drivers for Linux, for OSX, for every flavor of Windows. It's USB 3, and it also has a USB 3 port on it. So if you're using something you know, like an Air, 
Um, which hopefully I didn't just interrupt my connection. That was good. Okay. Hold music here. Do, do, do. Yeah, all right. Okay. So, if we're using, you know, a netbook or uh, an Air or even a tablet, whatever, something with USB 3, uh, it's very helpful. And we can, you know, with USB 3, we can stack multiples, right? We can have a bunch of different adapters in a bunch of different places. And they're cheap. So, my, my little Lego mime here. We want to listen, we don't want to talk. We don't want to be throwing traffic out on the network. Unless we're trying to analyze what our box is doing in a given situation, we don't want to have it just throwing traffic all over the place. And if you've ever just booted up Wireshark and hit listen, not even connected to a network, operating systems are so noisy. It's broadcast all over the place. And if you have sync services, you know, box.com, Dropbox, uh, you know, God help you if you're using any Apple services with Bonjour broadcasting all over the place. It's like a drunk guy at a party. <laughs> so, throw up the adapter, turn off the protocols. So we kill all the protocols, and now we're just going to listen. It creates a, a much more sanitized PCAP. Now, if you were some sort of cave person, you could use these. Um, super Smexy Hub Act. I, I, Smexy is a word, and I don't care who says otherwise. Um, they're nice because they're, they're abundant, right? You know, the back of a network closet somewhere, somebody has one of these things. The one scenario that I will disclaim where a hub can be very helpful is if you need one source in a lot of destinations. Because a hub is a layer one device, it's a repeater, right? It's like your really gossipy coworker. Everything it hears it just blabs back out. So to every single port without discretion. So if you have multiple, uh, multiple destinations for your packet capture and only one source, Switches don't always like that as much, um, where hubs have no problem with that at all. Uh, below that, we have the Throwing Star LAN tap. Uh, the gentleman out front looked like he was selling the slightly more polished version of this. These are okay. It's a fun project for soldering. Uh, the problem that I've had with them is they're asymmetric. So you patch them in, and they're only going to give you either receive or transmit, depending on how you patch them in. Uh, and both of these devices are going to drop us down to 100 meg. So another key point, um, you know, if you introduce a hub into your network, uh, collisions are stupid. We, we don't need to introduce collisions. It's, if this is all you have for a lab environment, it's fine. But realistically, if you're going to do a lot of PCAP scenarios, uh, I would recommend looking at uh, an inexpensive switch. So here are just two options. Uh, every vendor has something that plays in this space. The thing you want to double check is whether or not it supports a, a monitor mode um, or a span in the case of Cisco. And you want to check what the constraints around that are. So these devices are about 90 bucks each. They're little gig switches. These particular devices uh, will both boot off of PoE, which can be helpful if you're in an environment where you can't get power. Um, it's very easy to extend power with PoE. And um, they're, they're cheap, they're easy to program. Uh, word of caution, don't ever plug a switch into a production environment that you're not intimately familiar with. Spanning tree does not like that. Uh, network admins do not like that. So just make sure you have permission to know what you're doing when you plug in a foreign switch. Okay, so now the meat of what we're gonna talk about today. So for the purposes of today, you are the resident packet ninja at a, a company that's not real. But we're gonna explore a corporate network, and we're gonna walk through topology, and we're gonna talk about how to get packets from a variety of different places on that network. Uh, your goal is to Identify the problem as it's laid out in front of you and find the packets and solve the problem using your packet foo. So we're going to go through four different scenarios. Here is our topology. We've got three branch offices, a corporate network, and kind of a headquarters and connected up to the internet. So, first scenario, the boss is angry. What else is new, right? So today he's angry because the internal web application slows to a crawl every day at 12.01 p.m. The server team is blaming the network. That's never happened, right? <laughs> server team has never gone, I don't know, it's got to be the network. Server's fine. Task manager says it's great. I don't know what your problem is. Um, so our web server is a Linux box, and it's running locally in our data center. And this is an internal application we're looking at internal traffic. So here's our strategy. We're going to SSH into the web server. We're going to capture traffic over the lunch hour when the slowdown's happening. And we're going to use TCP dump. Now, key point here, we're going to set it up to record 50 megs of data in five files. 
Our capture is going to run continuously and override itself, so ring buffer. Is everybody familiar with the idea of a ring buffer? Just kind of keep overriding yourself? Yes, no? I, is that a vacant stare of acknowledgement? I'm not sure. All right, Steve. So our, our point is we're, we're going to do what we can to not flood the disk and tip over the server. That's bad etiquette. So we SSH into the server. We throw a TCP dump. Is this legible at all? Can you guys kind of see what the switches are there? All right. Good. Yeah. Thank you, guys, seven feet away. <laughs> all right. So TCP dump is very helpful, uh, included on just about every POSIX system, and it's going to use the native uh, libpcap libraries that are on the Linux system. So we're not installing any software. And that's a key point of working in a production environment. So we're going to specify our interface. Uh, TAC Big C is going to specify the file size in millions of bytes, so roughly 10 megs, 10 million bytes. Um, TAC Little S is going to specify the snap length of zero. Now the snap length is a parameter that says how much of the data to grab out of the packet. Most new versions of TCP dump will grab the whole packet by default. Older versions would not. Um, they would stop out for like 65,000 bytes or something. And so the, you need to specify this on old versions. New versions, you can largely ignore it. So if you've never seen this switch, you're not using it, it's probably not a big deal. I include it here as just a fail safe. If you work on an older system, specify TAC S0. It'll just make sure you get everything that you're trying to capture. So TAC little w is our file name, and TAC big w is the number of files we're going to create. So what we're doing, we're going to create a capture, interface Ethernet 0. We're going to let it create five different files, and it's just going to roll through those files as that data comes in. So we're going to always have sort of the last 50 megs of files broken out. And I broke it out into separate files because it makes it more digestible for analysis. That way Wireshark's not struggling away um, loading up huge files. So we ran our TCP dump, and here's what we have, five different files. Um, now, if you guys notice, the, the first file is the smallest one, so that's kind of where we dropped off on our ring buffer when I stopped this. It was on that top file. Next key step when we're doing analysis in a production environment, we're not going to dig through the traffic on the production box. We're going to pull it off into an offline box and do analysis there. Uh, historically, Wireshark has had some vulnerabilities parsing data, so we don't want to just install Wireshark in whatever box we're interested in and start ripping through traffic. We could potentially be introducing stability problems and vulnerability issues. So taking a look at our traffic, uh, basically what we did here is in Wireshark, we click Statistics, Conversations, IPv4, and we have a list of all the conversations. The one across the top, you can see this guy right here, he's by far the largest conversation. So one particular host is beating up on this. Now, if this was a huge production app, we'd probably see a lot more traffic, but this is a huge production app in my lab. So we're really just seeing one box beat up on this guy. So what we're going to do is create a quick filter, and we're going to look at that traffic from that strange host. So we identify our host here. Dot .25 is our server. Dot .167 is our host that's beating up on the server. So our next slide, uh, IP.source equals equals, and then we specify that client that's beating up on our host, and we see Tons and tons of Git requests. Um, and in our Git request, we see some strange parameters. One of the parameters says it's seeking the Etsy password file. Now, generally speaking, that's not a normal web request, unless you're Danny. <laughs> and it's usually dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, yeah. So that's an abnormal request. And we're seeing it from an inside address to our inside server. So we really want to figure out who, who Mr. Dot 167 is. Let's go talk to him, let's see what they're doing. Now we have a unique opportunity here because the source address is on the same subnet, so we're not gonna have to do a lot of digging to figure out who this client is. Um, because the source is on the same subnet, we can simply look inside Wireshark and see the MAC address and know that that's the MAC address of our host, more than likely, unless they're spoofing it, which is possible, but not terribly likely. So what MAC address would we see if this was a host on a different subnet? Router, exactly. Yeah, we'd see our router, and then we'd be investigating our router, and that's not that interesting. So looking at the MAC address that we've identified here, we jump into our, our managed switch, look at the MAC address table, do a quick uh, show MAC address table, pipe it into include, and that shows us what port he's plugged into. 
So after looking at the switch, we find an experienced auditor and he's running some web app scans over the lunch hour. So we promised not to cut a corner off his CISSP and he promised not to scan stuff during production hours without checking first. So we probably could have seen this behavior via the logs, but one thing that's important here is we now have evidence of this behavior. So if it ever goes further or if it was a hostile party, we've got evidence of this situation that we can put directly in an incident report. Um, more importantly, we demonstrated how to grab our traffic off our production system without adversely affecting production. On to scenario two. So let's see. Oh, you know what? This text down here is still too small. This says my wife says her uh, her development team looks exactly like this picture, except they have e-cigs. So <laughs> developers have a look. So in this scenario, the dev team is sending up an LDAP connection to an Active Directory domain controller. Sound familiar to anybody? Anybody ever gone through that? Um, they insist everything's correct, but their LDAP query just won't work. And so the domain controller is a production box, and in this environment, we're not allowed to install any software without going through a change control meeting, and we'd rather stand in front of a bus during traffic. So what we're going to do, we're going to use some built-in Windows tools to capture the traffic. We're going to export that into a format that Wireshark can read, and we're going to digest it that way. So the built-in tool we're going to use is NetSH Trace, and we're going to capture some packets on the domain controller, copy the trace file box uh, over to our analysis box, and use Microsoft Message Analyzer, which has the acronym MMA. It's the toughest protocol analyzer out there. And we're going to use that to convert the, uh, the traffic into a format that Wireshark will understand. Once we have the packets, we're going to look at the LDAP requests and see what's going on. Um, brief intermission, uh, moment of silence, Netmon is dead. So anybody use Netmon back in the day? Yeah, a couple hands, a couple guys that are older than 20. Um, you know, back, back in the early days of Packer, Packet Capture, when it was Ethereal, not Wireshark, uh, Netmon was your tool that you could install on Windows, and it installed its own driver library. So this is before the driver library was baked in with the event tracing for Windows architecture. Um, and event tracing for Windows, the, the ETL libraries, this is built into 2008 R2, Server 2012, Server 2012 R2, Windows 7, 8, 8, 1, I imagine 10 will include it as well, 32 and 64-bit. So we have this packet capture tool on all modern versions of Windows. Very important to know at least how to use it. So Microsoft Message Analyzer is Microsoft's Netmon replacement. We don't need Microsoft Message Analyzer to capture traffic. We just need it to view the ETL files. So I'm not going to go through this tracing architecture in depth. The slide's in here if you'd like to see how Microsoft leverages the stack. What you need to know essentially is that we used to do packet captures on Windows with the WinPCAP library and you'd have to install that and that could potentially be service affecting because you were modifying the network stack of a box while it was up and running. Now it's baked in so we have this NetSH trace command that we can utilize without affecting production. Uh, and NetSH trace outputs in the event trace log or ETL format. So here we show using it. Um, it's not a huge change, but you do need admin access because you are working pretty low in the protocol stack. And one key point, so I'm going to kick off this NetSH trace here, and you'll notice it just returns me to a command prompt. So very important to specify uh, file mode equals circular, because if you kick this off and you just go back to lunch and forget all about it, you will fill up the drive. Um, it doesn't sit there and show you what's actively running. It's not TCP dump with output or anything like that. It just drops you back to a prompt and assumes all well. So for this particular capture, we say capture, yes, file mode circular. We're going to specify our maximum size at 100 megs, grab a little bit more traffic than before. And we're specifying our trace file. Once again, it's that .etl format. So while it's running, if you want to see what it's doing, you can do this uh, NetSH trace show status, and that'll kind of dump and tell you what it's doing. But otherwise, if you don't do that, it just runs in the background. You don't see anything. It doesn't give you any feedback. When you're all set, you know, after the development team has made their requests, we can say NetSH trace stop. That'll stop the running capture, and we get a file. So we stop the capture. We see two files. We have a cab file, cabinet file, and a .etl, the .etl being the bigger one. So next step, 
we're on a production system, we're gonna take our capture, we're gonna pull it off the production system, bring it onto a Windows box, and it pains me to say this, but you're gonna to have to use a Windows box or a VM for at least this step, because Microsoft Message Analyzer is a Windows program, it's not ported over a format for other platforms. So here is our capture inside of MMA, uh, Microsoft Message Analyzer. Honestly, we could start digging into our LDAP traffic here. We could look and go through and find our LDAP requests, but there's a couple constraints here. One, uh, it, quick sidebar. Has anybody worked with Microsoft Message Analyzer? Show one, okay, Nate, yeah. Anybody else? Okay, th that's kind of the response that I found from folks. Uh, I'm curious, and by all means, reach out if you do work with this in the future. I found it to be just slow as crap. I mean, I, there's just no other way to say it. It just, it was so painfully slow to interact with. Nate, was that your experience as well? Yeah, so it was just, it was painfully slow, um, and then it is a single pat, uh, platform. It is you know the, the Windows architecture, and I don't primarily work in the Windows space, so I wanted to get in there and out of there as quickly as possible, like a dress shop. I don't even want to be there. Um, and the format's not convenient to share, right? So if you're sending this to an engineer on the other end of the phone helping you with support issue, he's not going to say, "Please send me your trace ETL file." He's going to say, "No, send me a PCAP." So we need to know how to export this. Uh, and most importantly, I really have no idea how to use it. I don't know how the filters work. I don't know how to sort stuff in here. So we're going to get out of this program as quickly as possible. File save as export. Uh, and this is where Netmon comes back in. We have the Netmon format capability. So we can export from MMA right into a .cap format. And then from there, we can open up .cap right in Wireshark. And now we see our traffic. So we see an LDAP response from the server in the dev box indicating a bind error usually an authentication problem, so we can share that result, we can show what the bind request looks like to the server with the dev team, to modify the program, and then LDAP bind success. So what is the point of this? We could have used Windows event logs and said, hey, failed LDAP, you know, maybe check your creds, whatever. But really, we were able to correlate the request and they can see how the request is arriving and what it looks like to the server. Uh, but most importantly, we showed you how to grab packets from a Windows box without installing anything. All these tools are baked in. Scenario number three, the security team. So a security team is evaluating a new IPS and they want you to help them get traffic. Um, has anybody here been through an IPS demo? A couple people, so for, for those of you that haven't, yeah, Jason. One or two. Um, when you demo an IPS, it's generally considered bad form to walk up to your network edge and rip out the upstream link and plug it into a box that you don't know how it works. We usually don't do that. All the packets fall over the floor, it's a big mess. Um, so when we're demoing a device like this, usually what we want to do is we want to create a mirror port and take all that traffic and, and let it do its thing and run out the door and then we're gonna mirror it over to something else and shoot it over to that box so we can kind of play with the box offline and not jack up our network. So here's our, our strategy. First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna look at our topology, understand what our topology is, and then look at the capabilities of the edge switch because that's gonna limit what we can and cannot span. Uh, once we've configured our port, we'll plug in, we'll use Wireshark and we'll validate that we're seeing the correct traffic. So. I know you guys memorized that first topology diagram and you don't need to look at it again, but just in case, here it is again. Um, I don't need your nonsense. <laughs> so, this is our corporate office and uh, we are summarizing, we have three different subnets here. We have a server network, a DMZ, and a WAN, and we're aggregating and going on our edge switch. So we have a 35.7. Uh, sorry, 3750 stack at our edge. So what we're gonna wanna do is uh, the server team requested to see the server traffic. So we are going to span the uplink on the server port. So in the Cisco world, we call uh, port mirroring spanning, switch port analyzer. That's their term, um, and it is relatively specific to their world. So different makes and models of switches have different capabilities. The biggest difference we see is how many simultaneous sessions can you do at the same time? And what can you use as a source? Sometimes you can use a whole VLAN as a source. Sometimes you can use multiple ports as a source. Say, give me these five ports and shove it out this other port over here. The one problem we run into when we see that, that method is 
it's very easy to oversubscribe. So if you span 20 ports out a single exit port, your rate limit is going to be whatever that single exit port is. So something to keep in mind as we're doing this. So in this instance, we have a 3750, um, and that's going to support two simultaneous span sessions, and it's going to be able to take uh, ports, a multitude of ports, and a VLAN as a source. So the first thing we're going to do, logging into the switch, is a show monitor session all. That just tells us if there's anything running. Uh, it would be considered bad form to log into the switch and clear all the monitor sessions right out of the gate if they're already looking at something. So then we're going to define our source port and define our destination port. So the commands are pretty straightforward uh, right here. So monitor session one source. So your sessions, it's going to be one or two on this particular switch because that's our limit. And then we're sourcing an interface. And then we're saying session one, destination, and then that's where we're going to plug Wireshark into is our destination interface. That's it. That's all there is to it. From there, we can do a show monitor session all, and that tells us what's going on. If we had multiple sessions, that would show us the details of each. In this instance, we just have session one. So now we can see our active session. Um, and now we're going to plug into port 12, our destination port, and validate that we're getting traffic. So now we've got some, some packets. We've plugged into gig 1012, we're all good. We tell security team, hey guys, you're ready to go. We have to copy the traffic over to you. And uh, they can plug in their IPS and start analyzing the traffic. Now again, this is duplicating another port. So realistically, it's a copy of everything. So for a security appliance, it'll alert. That's about it for the most part, with a couple exceptions. So security team's happy but they review the topology and realize they missed a couple networks. Um, so they'd like to see everything. So let's talk about what it looks like to span an entire trunk port. So in this instance, we look at the config of our trunk port. It's pretty straightforward. We just have encapsulation.1q. We're not pruning VLANs. All the VLANs are allowed across. And we say switch port mode trunk. So to get identical behavior on our span port, our destination port's gonna be configured as a trunk as well. So we say switch port trunk, encapsulation.1q, and switch port mode trunk. And what that's going to do for us is, as we send packets over to that, it's going to keep the VLAN tags intact. And so we'll be able to see which traffic came from which VLAN. So we'll create our monitor session, and we send it on our new trunk port. Plug the laptop into uh, G1012 again and capture some packets. So on our previous slide, our encapsulation right here was native which means no tags. Here we see dot one q So the traffic is egressing that port with frame tags still intact. That means if you're getting traffic from five different VLANs, you're gonna have five different tags. And you'll be able to sort through that traffic in Wireshark and see those frame tags. And that's very helpful in a big complex environment. It's extremely helpful if you're in an environment where the network folks maybe don't have a deep understanding of what traffic is on what VLAN and you're trying to sort it out for them. So here's our trunk traffic. We see uh, IP addresses from our three different networks, and most importantly, we see our tag specified. So right here, tag ID 99, so the VLAN tags is coming through, which is fantastic. Unless you're running Windows. Wah, wah, wah. So here is the same packet capture with and without tags. Um, and essentially what happens is that we see this 8021Q frame option, this just disappears in the capture as we're looking at Wireshark. There's not an error or anything, it's just not there. And so we look at it trying to figure out, okay, what is going on? Why are we not seeing that at all? Um, there's a couple different explanations for that. One, if we have native down here specified, well, what we're telling the switch is strip all the tags off before you dump it out the port. So that's a boo-boo on our monitor session statement. So that's easy to fix. Or Windows hates tags. Um, so uh, there's a couple issues with the Windows dr driver stack, and you can modify the registry. There's a link in here from Intel. I don't know if this works with every driver or not, but we were able to, with some Intel Ethernet drivers, make a couple registry changes, and then we would start to see the tags come through. So if you're doing any packet analysis and you guys need to see frame tags, um, this is good to know on the Windows side. Using uh, CentOS, Ubuntu, Red Hat, OS X, everything just came through. We saw the tags just fine. So I don't know why Windows strips the tags in the driver stack, but they do. So one more complication to our scenario. 
the security team still tweaking their hardware and they don't want to plug their IPS into the edge. They want to plug their IPS into a switch in their lab and it's on a different floor, it's a different switch. And they still want all the traffic. So how do we get the traffic from the edge back over to their lab? We use RSpan. So RSpan is remote spanning and basically what we're going to do is mirror port but on a different switch. So HP Brocade, Juniper and probably every other big managed switch vendor uh, we'll support this. They, most of those vendors refer to it as mirroring and remote mirroring. Key points, RSpan is not compatible with remote mirroring and if you have a Cisco switch, a Juniper switch, and a Cisco switch, it won't work correctly. These things usually are. So the way this works is we're going to define a VLAN for our network, and the VLAN is the transit for the remote span. And that's why that we're, we're dependent across the same environment all the way through. So we define a VLAN here, tell it to shoot all the traffic up to the VLAN. The switches use their natural ability to pass VLANs to another, and then this switch knows how to pull the traffic off that VLAN. So let's look at the configuration. Very, very similar to the monitor session configuration. The difference is we're gonna do everything times two because we're gonna configure the source and then the destination on each switch. So the first thing we're gonna do is create a VLAN, um, and then when you create this VLAN, this is just your RSpan transit VLAN. So it's not something you're using for anything else. Don't, don't use the printer VLAN, that's a bad day. Um, so we create the VLAN, and then we're gonna say remote span, letting Cisco know that our intention is to use this as a remote span VLAN. If you don't specify it as a remote span VLAN on every switch, uh, it won't work correctly. So once we've specified that we have our RSpan VLAN, we can do show VLAN and see that it's, it's populated and it's ready to use. Um, if you have VTP uh, or virtual trunk protocol, that will pass through automatically. A lot of folks don't like to use VTP, so you'll have to manually configure it on both sides in that case. So our source, we're gonna specify the source interface, and then we're gonna use the destination as VLAN 555. So we're seeing that here, on the left side right here, remote VLAN 555. So show monitor session all, and we see, and this is our source switch. We see take it from that port and dump it to that VLAN. Now on our lab switch, which is our destination, we're gonna see, say the source is a remote VLAN, and the destination is a local port. So over here, source out of VLAN 555, and then dump out the Ethernet port. And here is our results. We see all three networks, and that comes over from our lab switch. Now, in this instance, we don't see frame tags. Do you guys know why we don't see frame tags? They're stripped off when it's put on the remote VLAN. That's excellent. So, we cannot get free frame tags through in our span. It's a limitation of how the traffic travels the network. So the first switch tags it all 555, shoots it across the network, and then that remote switch strips all those tags out. So in this instance, great, we can shoot all the traffic over to another switch, but you no longer have tags in that. So scenario three, what we've shown is we duplicated traffic on our existing infrastructure. We didn't make any topology changes, we just mirrored some ports. We used a span session when we were on the same switch, and we used a remote span session when we were on a distant switch. Scenario four, the packet mop. Sometimes we drop traffic, and sometimes we want to know what that traffic was. So let's take a look at how to analyze drop traffic. So in our scenario, our company restricts outbound DNS, so only our DNS servers are allowed. Not terribly uncommon. Um, lately, we noticed that we're seeing a ton of packet drops and it's a bunch of DNS requests and they're circumventing our DNS servers. It's clients reaching out for DNS and, and they're circumventing our infrastructure. So to try and figure out what's causing this spike, we wanna look at that DNS traffic, that drop traffic after our firewall's already dropped it. We don't wanna allow it and then look at it. We wanna continue to drop it, but take a look and see what's going on. So in this instance, we're gonna use a Palo Alto. Um, you could certainly use a Cisco ASA, or if you absolutely had to, probably a Fortinet, I suppose. Maybe a Juniper if you're strapped. That was just a jab at a couple guys up front, so. All good hardware, they'll all do this just fine. 
Um, this is specific to firewalls, though. Uh, when we're talking like ACLs and switches, they don't generally have the capability to grab drop traffic. So firewalls can grab traffic at the drop state, though. On the Palo Alto, I'm just using a couple of CLI commands to initi uh, initiate the packet capture, and it's, it's just four commands. I'm not going to go through them real deep. Uh, Cisco is very similar, so are the other vendors, and I have a little cheat sheet at the end that will kind of go over that. So we're going to start the packet capture, and again, as we talked about before, um, these devices have resource constraints, so we want to use a filter. We're specifying a filter here and just saying, you know, show me the, the DNS traffic that you're dropping. We don't want to just grab all the traffic on our firewall. So we're going to start our capture, let it run for a little bit, and then stop the capture and download the file. All this can be done through the GUI on the Apollo and the Cisco as well. So after we've grabbed our drop traffic, we can dig into it in Wireshark and pull it up, and we can now see it's an internal host. Um, nice thing about DNS is it's wide open, right? So we can see the DNS requests, and the DNS are trying to resolve malware.com. And malware.com is not a real domain, it's just one I created for this example, but this behavior is real behavior. This, you will see this. If you have very strange DNS behavior, um, malware is an off, oftentimes a culprit. So this helps us understand, all right, this is not legitimate traffic, and we need to go look at those hosts. They may be infected. So drop traffic can be useful, helps us dig deep into the network issues. Um, and once again, a well-defined filter is important. We don't want to add too much overhead to the firewall. We don't want that thing tipping over. So to summarize what we showed you, we showed you how to grab traffic using TCP dump on a Linux host, how to use NetSH trace on a Windows host built in, how to create a span and an R span, again, vendor agnostic, there's mirroring and remote mirroring, it's very similar, uh, and how to capture drop traffic on a firewall. Uh, because there's a lot of CLI stuff in here, we created a little cheat sheet, and on my cheat sheet we have uh, the Cisco span commands, the R span commands, HP port mirroring, Juniper, Brocade, Palo Alto, Cisco ASA, Ortigate, uh, TCP dump, F5, which is TCP dump, so, um, NetSH trace, and T-Shark. If you guys think of any platforms where you'd like to see how to set up captures or mirrors and it's not included on here, uh, reach out. I got some white space to fill. We'll update it. And here are the download links I promised you for all the content. So if you want, go ahead, download that. Uh, are there any questions? Would anybody like another mimosa? <laughs> okay, well, there we go. Thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs>